Good morning. Um, I'm Dr. Davis. I'm going to present uh, about an hour long, 45 minutes to an hour long uh, program called When Hemp CBD Extracts Become Bioactive Miracles, New Clinical Findings. <clears throat> Greetings to everyone from the Bioregulatory Medicine Institute, uh, of which I'm uh, a board member and, and uh, enjoy the wonderful people there and all the other folks that may be listening in on this. I will take some questions at the end. So let me give you some of my background. Um, it's really important, I think, to address issues about hemp CBD. It's going to need to be called phytocannabinoid rich extracts, and I'll explain why that's the case. But if you look at all the literature that's out there and many of um, many of the products, they're still labeled CBD. And we're going to talk about why that's a problem. I started my holistic practice in 1978 as a holistic chiropractor with a, a two-year background in classical homeopathy training in that and uh, very much familiarity with anthroposophical medicine, and which I'm very grateful for because that teaches us so much about bioenergetics of a substance, not just the gross chemistry, but <clears throat> the bioenergetics of the substance. And that's very, very important in cannabis products, um, hemp extracts, and it is not being discussed. And so that's the purpose of what I'm going to present today is why it's so important to understand the energetics of the extract. So I started a herbal company in 1981, and that still exists today. And now I have an organic herb farm in Central Tennessee and a manufacturing plant three miles away. And that allows us to make fresh plant herbal extracts and get them harvested into the facility where they're extracted in, in even as little as an hour. So what that allows us to do is to preserve the bioenergetic integrity and to get things while they're still in colloidal suspension. And that was one of the great keys of homeopathic mother tinctures that were fresh plants. Uh, and many of those, they stopped being made. I mean, it's, even in the late 80s, uh, 90s, <clears throat> last century here in this country, companies started getting away from it because it was just more complicated. And then in Europe, they were still doing fresh plant mother, extra, uh, mother tinctures. But it's a very important thing when you're talking about the energetics. So I mentioned this, and I'll repeat it again. We'll see this on the screen, that we want to talk about phytocannabinoid-rich extracts because if we keep the language of CBD extracts, we're going to be running into a problem uh, with the FDA, who is basically tasked with protecting the interests of the patent holders, the large drug companies who have patents on CBD extracts and are using supercritical extraction technology as part of those patents. So I think and I hope that many of these producers change that so that they can avoid problems. The product that I've formulated is a phytocannabinoid rich extract. So <clears throat> we're hearing about the great miraculous stuff when some poor little child has uncontrolled epileptic seizures and they get some of the different CBD extracts that should be called phytocannabinoid-rich extracts. And miraculously, gee, they, their, uh, their horrible seizure activity is less. And that, that gets headlines. But what's happening is we're missing where huge, we're talking tens of millions of people, maybe a hundred million people in the United States, maybe even more, would be very, very wise to be using the right kind of hemp extract for preventive reasons and possibly to reverse certain things. One of the things that I see going on, and this is talked about here as a major thesis, I believe from what I'm seeing in patients that there is low-grade neuronal brainstem and brain deterioration and it is an underlying, for example, common chiropractic subluxation, why people's bones go out of place. And I've checked that clinically now for two years. I'm seeing a very strong correlation of so-called bones being out of place, applying transdermal hemp extract. And many times the bones somewhat go back in place. So they've neurologically been triggered to uh, cause contraction of the muscles appropriately to reposition the bones. It's amazing how when you turn on the endocannabinoid system, 
from properly prepared hemp that it has this profound curative ability. So here's a little video that uh, this will play. It kind of reviews, and this was made a couple of years ago, so it's still referring to CBD instead of phytocannabinoid rich extracts. <clears throat> If you haven't heard of CBD cannabidiol, you probably will soon. It is one of many natural healing chemicals found in two different types mm -hmm. of the extraordinary hemp plant. Industrial hemp is produced for food, fiber, and naturally occurring healing chemicals such as CBD cannabidiol. It contains only trace levels of THC and is non-psychoactive. Increasing advocacy will ensure free availability for all. Medical marijuana contains much higher levels of THC that have psychoactive properties. It is often used to treat serious late-stage illness. It is a controlled substance that requires prescription. When high-grade medicinal strains of industrial hemp are extracted properly, they offer a huge range of naturally occurring compounds that possess anti-inflammatory, immune-enhancing, bone-regulating, and most of all, anti-stress properties, all in one plant. Holistic medical clinical evaluation shows that olive oil extracted industrial hemp directs the body into the parasympathetic healing mode. Okay, so <clears throat> that last thing is the second part of what I really want everyone to take away, and I'll repeat that at the end of this program. But so Number one, what if we have low-grade neuronal brainstem and brain deterioration going on as a result of unacceptable levels of electromagnetic interference, and which is coming from Wi-Fi, uh, satellite, every form of, of energy being shot around us, extraordinary amounts of environmental contamination coming down from the skies and many other different things. Our body's under tremendous assault. I think that's having a low level, long-term chronic damaging effect to these areas of our fundamental function of our body, the central nervous system. And the second thing that you just saw in that little presentation is, if we think about holistic medicine, probably one of the largest areas that's being treated is so-called adrenal fatigue, adrenal stress syndrome. And large amounts of glandulars and every sort of herb is being used. And my herbal company makes several wonderful products to assist uh, uh, in recovery from adrenal fatigue. But I think we're missing the point. And when I started using these wonderful um, PCR, phytocannabinoid rich extracts, I started seeing a whole new approach to stress and adrenal stress syndrome because it looks like, and we can measure it, the sympathetic nervous system stops firing and pushing, and it becomes moved toward the parasympathetic healing mode. So that's huge, those two things. If we just say, <clears throat> yes, it could be used as a sleep aid, because it can, um, some cannabinoids, uh, not CBD, but other cannabinoids have more selective ability to help sleep. Different strains of cannabis have better abilities to help sleep. So that in itself is very complicated. But the biggest thing that it does, and I've looked at many different, like probably seven different varieties now that I've extracted, <clears throat> they all seem to, if they're high quality material, they all seem to have that ability to help move the body out of sympathetic dominance which is what's making people just incredibly exhausted into the parasympathetic healing mode. So that's really, really important. So I want to describe how I found what I believe is, is quite novel information. And I really would like people to pay attention and talk about this with other people. And as health practitioners, try and uh, prove what I'm commenting on. And then I've had many patients that have proven this and patients of doctors that are colleagues that I work with. So I've seen a fair amount of evidence outside of my own clinic, but we need to keep evaluating what I have discovered to see if, if it's true uh, overall. So what I started out doing is I acquired about 12 brands of uh, leading brands uh, and got those in my office, and they were all 
almost all CO2 extracted. This is uh, the hemp material is dry. It comes into an extractor. Um, it's and CO2 is injected in as a liquid. Uh, then pressure is increased. I, mean, I think someone told me the temperatures it goes up to 137 degrees Fahrenheit. There's an extraction over a period of time, and then it's taken out and goes through a whole bunch more steps. <clears throat> but there are what are called phase changes. And no one in today's world pays attention to the alchemy of processing plants. And in the history of medicine, I spent a long time looking at Ayurvedic and European alchemy and understanding these people didn't spend all that time being very attentive with the way that they made the extracts and the preparations. They did it for a reason. They did it for the bioresonance and for the bioactivity and the subtle energy fields that have to do with, guess what? They have to do with cell signaling. And we're going to get to that later, but one of the great, great abilities, abilities of hemp, why it's a miracle, is the amount of cell signaling that is orchestrated between the terpenes and the cannabinoids in hemp. It's astonishing, and I've never seen it in the hundreds of plants that I've worked with over the years. So some of the plants were also extracted by ethanol. One of them was extracted by isopropyl alcohol, and the ones that were extracted by toxic solvents like hexane and so on, I didn't use those. Okay, so I had these brand-leading products, and then I had the ability to do something else that was very interesting. I found a supplier in Kentucky that was producing a very high-quality strain of one of the cherry varieties of hemp. And he grew that and had grown it for many years. It was a very stable and it was a high quality product. We had purchased that to use uh, at the beginning stages of when we first started making the herbal, the herbal extracts of hemp. And that same company with that same herbal material goes over to their CO2 extractors and they make a thick paste, which they sent me some of that thick paste, but they also dilute that paste from the same material and put it into medium chain triglycerides MCT, which is actually a waste product. Um, it's, it's not a great thing. Look, look at the, uh, um, the manufacturing process for medium chain triglycerides. It's, it's kind of interesting. So that's, that's uh, the reason it's used is because it doesn't uh, congeal at room temperature. Um, olive oil also does not congeal at room temperature and has an extraordinary uh, amount of uh, therapeutic uh, value just on its own, uh, extra virgin organic olive oil. So, <clears throat> so I had the herb, uh, the dried hemp, that went to my company, and I did a whole bunch of different extraction processes. I don't have a CO2 extractor. I didn't want one as a result of what I saw, but we had, we're masters What happened when I used different kinds of, in this case, at the beginning, the same material, so I had some degree of control, the same cherry variety was used in alcoholic extraction, it was used in my olive oil extraction, and it was used in the commercial um, CO2 extraction by that company. So, <clears throat> CO2 and alcoholic extracts do work. I mean, if they didn't, they wouldn't continue to sell. I think one of the isopropyl alcohol extracts is $150 an ounce. Uh, the product we've created is $97 an ounce, and I feel it's a far superior product. But when people are spending that amount of money, they better see some results, and they do. If the endocannabinoid tone is so bad in depleted adrenal, so we call that adrenal syndrome, almost any reasonable CBD product seems to help for a while. So a lot of the new patients that I had, strikingly, they came in, they were already taking CBD products. So I'd have them just routinely, the new patients, I'd say, hey, if you're taking CBD, bring it in. I would check to see if they were currently taking it, and then I did something very interesting. I tried to find the things that it wasn't correcting. So I found by this process that I'm going to show in these little videos, I found something very interesting. 
let me take you to the first one here if I can get this to play. And this has a long introductory marks, remarks here. We're going to try and get through to this and just show you the actual testing. I'm here with Jenny, and I'm looking at another application for the transdermal CBD that I've been developing, and it's um, it's incredibly. Now this this is in a little bottle where it had come from. You know, we logged it in and made batches and control all the stuff that we normally do for me to start working with it, and. Um, but it didn't have a label yet, but it was a manufactured product and eventually we put a label to it. That's what I'm using here. This was one of the products that I decided I should try to see what happened if we applied it transdermally. The endocannabinoid receptors in the skin are all over the place and they're a little different than the enteric receptors that are scattered throughout the body and then the receptors that are in the central nervous system. We brought acting. What I have found is something that does not appear in any literature. I have seen, and that is how the transdermal applications can affect the musculoskeletal system that we can measure. So if we use standard muscle testing, which developed by Kendall and Kendall, physical therapist, and then developed much more by Dr. Goodhart, chiropractor, and apply kinesiology, hold this here, keep your arms in that position, don't let me push, and so on. And so her muscle tone is really good, but in this particular area, keep this here. Push hard. Okay, it's just. So I have a funny little thing I want to interject here because um, most of the time, in fact, almost always in my office, I don't run into this. But if I do demonstrations uh, out in the public, I will run into the naysayers. You know, I'll be doing a, you know, a, a test like this. This is testing the rhomboids. It's a very, very specific test. I'm trained how to do it neuromuscular test. It's a valid medical test. And you hear someone from the audience is somewhere, I don't believe in this kind of thing. No, they shouldn't be in the, in the function to begin with. And they're saying, um, oh, you're not pushing this hard. So lately, I've taken a very interesting response. I said, so when you're in your physician's office, if he pulls out his stethoscope, listens to you and says, you know, I think you've got a problem. How likely are you to say, ah, you're just making that up. So <laughs> it's really interesting. Separate yourself right away from the naysayers because it doesn't matter what you say. They're not going to believe what you're doing. These tests are valid. They've been done thousands and thousands of times by me, and they've been done millions of times. 1964, when applied kinesiology started. Um, applied kinesiology is now referring to its members as PAK, professional applied kinesiologists, to try and differentiate them from people that have gone off on a weekend and learned how to do a few muscle tests. And that is a problem. This takes a lot of skill to understand the amount of force uh, between a 90-year-old person and a 25-year-old football player. The amount of force that you have to put into the system is very operator-dependent, depends on the operator, depends on the patient. That's a skill. You have to develop that. So this lady was strong. Those muscles were very strong. So normally, in, as a chiropractor, we would, look at the, we would look at the structural things involved here, the thoracic vertebrae, and we would figure out an adjustment, a number of different ways of correcting that. But it's a, it's a neuromuscular weakness. It's probably neurological. There's, she didn't have any injuries to the rhomboid muscles, so there's not, it's not structural. It's some sort of a functional disorder that's making them not work right. So that results in tightness in this area, right, Jenny? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I asked her, and she's in good shape. I said, what's the one thing in your body that seems to be maybe not right? And so this is what I've been doing with, as I look at this CBD for transdermal use, this is what I've been doing. I've just been saying to people, you know, uh, what the heck is, doesn't seem right. Is, is it what will get some on here? It's not a problem. So I'm just going to first, let's just see. Which I so this is interesting because I'm caught in the act. Uh, this happens to me quite often. I was going to put it locally and then something said, no, no, don't do that. This may have been the first case when I did this a couple of years ago where I thought, well, what will happen if I put it remotely away from the site into the upper cervical spine and brainstem area? Because this plant, after I'd done my 61 page white paper, I realized how extraordinary the cell signaling capability of the terpenes and the cannabinoids is. So I thought, hmm, well, I wonder what will happen. So here we see. <laughs> I'm going to put it 
some occipitally and here. The um, transdermal CBD, which I'm really careful to say, is hand extracted <clears throat> with this magnificent, simple process, very high quality material extracted with a beautiful uh, uh, organic uh, olive oil. And it passes through the skin. It doesn't need carriers. It doesn't need liposome to the system. It doesn't need it. It's, the plant has it itself. And you actually, in my opinion, don't want to interfere with that natural thing at all. So we put it into this area, and I want to see what's going to happen neurologically to an area down the spine. I don't know. I don't know if anything will happen, but let's let's just go ahead. Okay, make fists. Raise this up. This one, hold it in that position. Don't let me push it. Okay, so what happened? What in the world? <laughs> <laughs> is it, how is that possible? Yeah, how is that possible? Okay, they're all this here. Let's try it again. Pull hard. Yeah, it's your normal muscle. So that adorable little voice, I've never forgotten that in two years. How is that possible? I've now had scores of patients look at me and go, what? Because it almost doesn't make sense. <laughs> okay, so what the heck just happened, right? Yeah. <laughs> So <clears throat> I turned uh, this lady over and tur I rubbed the, we found that the adrenal uh, reflexes were showing weak, rubbed it transdermally on that, and they immediately were removed. Now what's very, very significant is when I had the CO2 extract, the hemp products, the approximately 12 of them sitting on my desk, or people would bring in their own, I would often rub those on first to see if they would strengthen the reflex just as easy. And in most cases, they did not. And I'm going to probably repeat that a few times because you have to understand how significant that is. It's the same person, the same test. It's actually applying this stuff in the same region. So all of that is consistent. There's only one thing that's different. It's the way, well, the hemp is different because we're, the company that did it is not using the same hemp I did, but the companies that I was using <clears throat> are supposed to be, you know, ethical and high quality companies. And it, as far as I could tell, it is the extraction process that made the difference between maybe 90% of the CO2 extracted products do not have that neurological immediate effect of changing muscle strength. I couldn't move my arms or... Like, yeah, I couldn't hold them at all. But, but as soon as you put that on, they held strong. Yeah. Yeah. So here is uh, another little uh, video that I shot in the office. And this is also in the, in the early stages. So Joan um, has been coming in for various things. Um, I did something um, that's a particular kind of an injury recall. Um, I'm going to try and kind of move, remove to get rid of extra. This was, the, these videos are shot for uh, applied kinesiology physicians that know this, and I'm talking kind of a little bit of extraneous information here. But what I wanted to get to is the point, let's see, after this. Okay, so Joan was a very athletic person, and she's complaining of a particular area in her low back. All right, so there's where we pick the section, which is a nice general build torque, build tension training. So that, and that was not a structural correction, that was a brain memory correction, and it got rid of the neural testing. But she, in, in this injury that she had, that, and she still gets a spot at L3 down there. And so I thought, well, let's check the quadratus of the So pull it on the table, we're going to turn this this way, and then don't let me pull. Okay. Now that the quadratus lumborum is a hard muscle to test. It's just so you have to lift up the whole legs and it's just a really strong muscle when it works. And then on her it has absolutely almost virtually no strength. There's just not anything there. And I have no idea. I'm gonna do one thing to see if it'll if it will correct the injury. Okay. Um and then I'm gonna do the Nothing there. Okay. So now remember, I'm going to repeat on these particular videos. I did not, these are made for colleagues. I didn't 
I told them to do the experimentation using conventional CO2 extracted CBD. I had just showed them using the olive oil extracted, this proprietary method of, of olive oil extraction. That's what's being used here, which, which if it's going to work, it works. Um, but I left it up to other practitioners as I'm leaving it up to everyone that looks at this. Make sure that you either have someone that knows how to do this or get a doctor that knows how to do this. Watch the difference because it's very, very significant what it means in the end. So we've got the new CBD. Actually, let's do it two different ways. Let's do it first of all with this. If you will, if we sit up. I'm going to do what I've been doing. I'm going to put it at the iliac crest and the sacrum. I'm just going to put it now. Of course, the area that she was talking about was there, but this stuff seems to be the grand communicator. This product is under development. I only have the label yet for it, but it's coming very soon. And I'm going to go right in there. It really, you could put it almost anywhere because it seems to get into the system so quickly. All right, that's there. Now let's go up to here because I've been normally putting it on the upper cervical spine. Okay, right, let's go. We did it. We did it. We can do this orally as well. And interestingly enough, in many cases, applying bioactive hemp products orally will also immediately remove neuromuscular failed and neuromuscular reflexes. They will change muscular strength in what we would call inhibited muscle. Generally, there's nothing wrong with the muscle itself. The spindle cell is fine. The origin insertion are fine. The tendon is part of the muscle is fine. Ligamentous part is fine. But there are other things neurologically, apparently, that are being turned off. And so we'll go here, pull down the side of the table. Okay, now don't let me pull. She's no way. <laughs> oh my gosh. So again, that was using, um, I'm not a particularly powerful person, but that was using all the strength that I had against and a, and a quadratus foam born should be able to take that it's a very very strong muscle but it it, it it didn't budge so that's a good example there you could apply uh if you want to test the theory that i'm talking about get have your patients or if you're you're a patient have your doctor test various things using your existing if it's a co2 extract and watch and see what happens So let us return here. <clears throat> this is a different, this is um, a different sort of, this is the concentrated juice of the product in a different sort of a test. Pull strong up toward the ceiling, pull hard. Okay. Okay, pull up toward the ceiling, pull hard. Then down, pull hard. And these were all different facets of checking for osteoporosis, osteopenia, compression. So again, remember, these are reflex tests. None of these tests are ever diagnostic. And that was one of the things that Dr. George Goodhart strenuously taught, that applied kinesiology is a tremendous search tool to enable us to hone into areas that are not functioning correctly. And before you made a final diagnosis, you'd have to have the history and all these other things. In this case, if you're talking about osteoporosis or osteopenia, you'd have to have x-ray. But these are indicators, and they're, they're indicators that are linked into the neurology of the body. And that's what I was using this for, not to arrive at a final diagnosis, but to just simply look at the difference between pre and post if one thing consistently changes it and another type of a process does not change it consistently, it says something. You have to figure out what that says. Of um, the disc. And what we found before when we did this, 
you do it now and you're repeating this, they did not give anything. I'm checking to see what the colloidal hemp terpenes can do for this. Raise yourself up and drop on your heels hard, like you did that before. Drop hard one. Okay, let's do two more times. Okay, and one more time. Okay, now thumbs up toward the ceiling. Pull up toward the ceiling hard. Strong. There, pull strong. And then thumb straight toward the floor. Keep that up and pull, pull strong. Kaboom. So that test when I first saw it was 30 some years ago, probably. And I it really I just happened to think of it in this particular case that I was looking at. I believe, <clears throat> I would maybe hear from corrections from someone, but I think that's getting into the, you know, the L5S1 area. I'm looking at disc. It's a potential, it's a screening, measure, a screening method for potential disc involvement, I think. But the point of it is it weakened when you gave impact, which puts impact into the sets, it puts impact into the bone. And it's putting impact into all the joints from the heels all the way up. So it's checking many things, but it's just showing a failure of resistance. Okay, so we're going to- Or what we would call an inhibited muscle. This is a coil of terpenes plus. This is a unique product that is the liquid of the hemp plant when it has no THC, only trace amounts of CBD, but all this other extraordinary rich range of over 500 phytochemicals. And that's concentrated into a, into a juice and it's uh, put into this uh, bottle. So let's do that same thing again. Raise up and drop down hard on the heels. Okay, again. One more time. Okay, then turn. And hold it there. And pull up towards the ceiling. So <clears throat> what we see here is it abolishes the weak reflex. And depending on the history of the patient, that tells you what could be significant about it. But the point is, a lot of times other things won't do that, or they might do that. But then, for example, with the CHT plus, check it against so-called adrenal reflexes, which are often kidney deficiency reflexes, uh, loss of that core natal energy when people are depleted enough. And this CHT plus seems to have an extraordinary ability. It's just a nutrition, super nutritional addition, um, a dietary supplement addition that's just extraordinary. So that's nice. Let's go ahead then and come on back. And so <laughs> what's going on when you apply something to the body and remotely, and all of a sudden the neurology has changed so the muscles uh, inhibition is gone, so the muscle regains its normal strength. Signaling is going on. Um, you can do this orally, so it's uh, sublingually, but what's fascinating to me is to watch it transdermally. If you don't have the taste receptors involved, you have other receptors, you have the, the endocannabinoid receptors in the skin, but what it, it clearly is telling you that signaling is going on. And when you look at online at hemp education, I mean, there's a lot of hemp education websites. They all show pick beautiful elaborate pictures of CD1 and CD2 receptors. That's a G protein coupled receptor, <clears throat> but there are other receptors. That's not the only one. So it definitely interacts with these things called PPARs that are nuclear hormone receptors. Here's the big part that control the transcription of target genes. Then these other things, probable interactions, probable, probable, with these other three other very, very important types of, of receptors that turn cells and turn processes on and off in the body. The thing that's the most spectacular to me is that in this plant, it looks like we have a huge addition to nutrigenomics in one plant. The ability through cell signaling to change uh, gene expression. 
terpenes are uh, they're commonly called terpenes, but they're really more more uh, accurately terpenoids. That's when the essential oil components are in a dried plant. This there was a wonderful text that I got uh, published in the early 2000s when I was doing my research. Um, that was oh three or four, four or five hundred pages long, just on terpenes. And that was these um, professors that wrote it. That was their specialty. And this is an exact quote from that, a summary. Terpenoids have important functions as messengers within organisms, within organs, and within the cell body, and particularly between the cell surface and the cell nucleus. They can influence cell stage and mitosis, resulting in changes in morphology and differentiation. Terpenoid end products can interfere with change, gene expression, or more directly act as key enzyme regulators. So again, both cannabinoids and terpenes can influence uh, nuclear material and gene, gene activity. So pretty exciting. That means that an awful lot of things could be happening that we would need to try to notice and then uh, pay attention to. The polyphenols are not being discussed in hemp because the companies that verify the, the value of the hemp are not running flavonoid assays. The flavonoids are you know, bioflavonoids, you vitamin C and bioflavonoids. They're extremely important. Um, they're very antioxidant, anti-inflammatory. So, so when we're talking about CO2 extracts versus all these other kinds of extracts versus the olive oil extract that I came up with, what's the difference? Chemically, if you analyze them, you're just seeing if it has cannabinoids, you're seeing if it has terpenes, and our products have uh, a QR code at the bottom of the box. You can scan it and immediately see the batch characteristics, including the cannabinoids, terpenes, heavy metals, uh, no pesticides, of course, no heavy metals. So all of that's shown for every batch, and that's you know that's state of the art. No no company has a better better product, but that's kind of like you kind of got to start with that, but that doesn't really say very much about quality. It just says whether the ingredient is there or not. Now, Bioregulatory Medicine Institute folks and people are familiar with homeopathy and most of the doctors, I think all the doctors that do apply kinesiology proficiently, they're all aware of the energetics because they already know that you can check one nutrient, one vitamin C, against another vitamin C, and one of them will test differently. That's where I came up with this idea after being a member of that organization since 1981. So I've seen this for decades. It, it wasn't an invention of mine. It's just I decided to apply it to him and to looking at these so-called CBD products, which are really kind of, well, they are CBD only products if the people are making isolates. And that's gonna be more and more difficult for people to do. They're going to need to be making whole plant extracts, which are phytocannabinoid rich extracts. <clears throat> so, so if quality is defined only on the presence or absence of a chemical, like CBD or THC or particular terpenes, that doesn't answer biological difference that you can see in the kind of testing I was just showing you. What it ends up, what it ends up coming to the fore, if you look more deeply into how biology operates, there's a whole quantum realm that is acting in the system that mainstream science ignores. It's as if it's not there, but it's the most important thing in our whole bodies because it's it's the it's the region where cell, cell signaling is critical. There's um, this link. Let's see if it will open. Um, this is uh, available, and you can stop um, the presentation and try and find that link. I met this. Uh, PhD research researcher when he's getting his PhD uh, work done at the University of Hawaii. And I worked with him and I showed him some things that I've been developing. I got to know him, an absolutely brilliant man, now in his 30s. But this 28-page document, everyone should read. 
it is still on the internet. It was taken off from the site that was inhabited, but this should be read and reread and read and read again until you understand this extremely complicated information about what happens in the genetic material, what happens also throughout the cell, and how light encoded information moves through the body, signaling all kinds of things, basically at light speed. It's a quantum biological event, and it can't be measured in all the kinds of pharmaceutical and mainstream science, so it's simply ignored. But you can't ignore it, because it is what explains the invisible realm of why things are triggered by homeopathy, why things are triggered by different methods of preparation, Ayurveda, and here in the hemp business, why different methods of extraction affect the energetics of the substance. When you take phase changes <clears throat> with liquid CO2 and then you evaporate it, and, or if you take ethanolic extracts and you do what's called winterizing, which is freezing it, you're doing phase changes so that that influences the energy of the substance, which has an effect on the subtle characteristics of the body. If you're not measuring anything subtly or you don't care to, it still has an influence. You, know, you may not measure it, it has an influence in how quickly it works. All right, let's get back to where we are here. <clears throat> so, I want to kind of wind this up and I'll take a couple of questions, but hopefully this point has been made clear. You have to test the, hopefully all products, but certainly products that are said to contain CBD now, if they're appropriately called phytocannabinoid-rich products, you have to test them uh, to make sure. Just uh, seeing I got a little noise coming out of my phone here. Make sure that they're biologically active. One of the ways that I was intrigued that will show what are called formative forces. When I talk about the invisible realms of what we just saw in that light encoded DNA, those are forces that exist, but they're not in four dimensional space time, XYZ time. They're not in the world that we normally measure. They're in the world of quantum biology, which is above the fourth dimension, fifth dimensions and above. It's very real. And the brilliant uh, soil scientist, uh, Aaron Free Pfeiffer, who is the, grand, the father of. Uh, of biodynamic agriculture, he figured out that you could measure these invisible forces in a physical way. And it was just a brilliant discovery influenced by the integration of uh, Rudolf Stanley. If you take 5% copper sulfate solution and in a vibration controlled, humidity controlled environment, leave it for about 18 hours, it will form this type of very harmonious pattern, which, and it'll do it again and again. It's a very consistent form of pattern if you just use, you know, pure water and, and copper sulfate. Then you can start doing things to that, and the copper sulfate crystals will give you information. If you put a sample of human blood in that, it can give you patterns that, after extraordinary amount of training, can be correlated with diagnostic ability in the human body. Dr. Uh, Pfeiffer first did it to plants. He found that he could test the vibrancy of a plant, the health of the plant, or he had two different varieties. He could see which one had more dynamic energy, more vital energy, by taking plant sap, putting it in here, and looking at the pattern that formed in a crystal array. Now, if you do an internet search, if it's still up there, I just did a couple of days ago, just search sensitive crystallization uh, in Google. And I saw some very interesting articles uh, within the last few years from Indian researchers who were showing the high degree of diagnostic ability to use sensitive crystallization with patients to find a screening test for oral cancer. And it's extremely accurate between the mid 80s up to almost 100% accuracy when compared to cytology and normal uh, acceptable 
standards for, for rendering a diagnosis of cancer. It had a very, very high correlation. They're saying, well, you know, let's do this in India because it's inexpensive. It can be done in a day. This is just another example of a way that you can physically measure something that you can't see, but that is very real. So hopefully uh, that is, um, will we'll drive home the point that we can be using a product therapeutically. We can understand the gross chemi chemistry of it, whether the chemicals are present or absent. If cannabinoids aren't present, we got a really bad product. And anybody that's doing an accurate assay should show you the level of cannabinoids, the level of THC, the level of terpenes. And you can look at products that have exactly the same levels. So like the one that we produce is standardized to 600. We standardize it by a very interesting form of concentration. We don't add external material to it. We just a pure native natural extract. But it's at least 600 milligrams per ounce. And you'll see a lot of that, where there's a paste that is used by most people, and they just concentrate, they dilute the paste until it gets to the concentration of chemicals that they want. And if, if, if it's accurate labeling, then that's appropriate. You have the amount of chemicals in there. It does not tell you the bioactivity of it. And bioactivity assays are a whole other matter. They do them in pharmacology very extensively. Generally, it's in vitro and laboratory vascular or in experimental uh, strains of mice, not in humans for obvious reasons. But we can use the wonderful techniques of applied kinesiology and electrodermal screening and other methods as well to measure the energetics of something. So it's very, very important. Okay, <clears throat> so let me look here. Um, well, uh, review again what is wrong with CO2 extraction of yeah. hemp. All right, well, let's talk about what's right with it. What's right with it is it's clean, it's reproducible, and it can provide very nice quantifiable levels of active ingredients, CO, uh, of, of the cannabinoids, um, and terpenes, and so on. My experimental evidence shows that it does not have the same bioresonance and it does not affect the nervous system the same way as or olive oil extract. That should be proven by other people until it becomes very clearly known in the industry if that's correct or not. So lots of people getting to work on this will end up validating if that's true. Uh, let's see. Oh, and here's another question. Um, in how many patients uh, have you measured the different outcome of different types of CBD extracts? Well, that's hard to calculate. Um, not more than 200, and probably be certainly between 100 and 200 people that I've taken the time to rub on one stuff, check it, and what does this mean? This is time, when I see a patient like that, I'm not charging them for that. I charge them for when I'm doing regular routine therapy, and I have the most wonderful patients, I'll say, hey, can we take a few minutes to do this? And that's, you know, that's off the, that's off the clock. That, that's not charged for. But I have these absolutely wonderful patients that go, yeah, sure, you know, what's, what's up with that? And, uh, and so it's a joy. It, it makes my practice so much fun. But it's, um, we can see this, there's a little, uh, the flexor digit minimi and the uh, opponent's follicus, but major groups, the muscles that are called an O-ring testing, those can be used. They require knowledge on how to do it. It's very easy to overpower those muscles. And the best muscle that I encourage people to use for testing is the piriformis muscle. You can look online and see, and probably it's even maybe on, on uh, YouTube, how to isolate and, and test that big muscle. It's like you, you got a, a long lever arm on the foot onto the leg, and boy, it's pretty hard to test that muscle poorly if you set it up correct. And you can find that weak and apply these different extracts and see if it strengthens it. It's a lot of fun. Thanks for joining me.